I can hardly describe the mood in which I was left by this harrowing episode. An episode at once mad and pitiful, grotesque and terrifying. The grocery boy had prepared me for it, yet the reality left me nonetheless bewildered and disturbed. Puerile though the story was, old Zadok's insane earnestness and horror had communicated to me a mounting unrest which joined with my earlier sense of loathing for the town and its blight of intangible shadow. Later, I might sift the tale and extract some nucleus of historical allegory. Just now I wished to put it out of my head. The hour had grown perilously late. My watch said 7.15, and the Arkham bus left Town Square at 8. So I tried to give my thoughts as neutral and practical a cast as possible. Meanwhile, walking rapidly through the deserted streets of gaping roofs and leaning houses toward the hotel where I had checked my valise and would find my bus. Though the golden light of late afternoon gave the ancient roofs and decrepit chimneys an air of mystic loveliness and peace, I could not help glancing over my shoulder now and then. I would surely be very glad to get out of malodorous and fear-shadowed Innsmouth and wish there was some other vehicle than the bus driven by that sinister fellow sergeant. Yet I did not hurry too precipitately, for there were architectural details worth viewing at every silent corner, and I could easily, I calculated, cover the necessary distance in a half hour. Studying the grocery youth's map and seeking a route I had not traversed before, I chose Marsh Street instead of State for my approach to Town Square. Near the corner of Fall Street I began to see scattered groups of furtive whisperers, and when I finally reached the square, I saw that almost all the loiterers were congregated around the door of the Gilman House. It seemed as if many bulging, watery, unwinking eyes looked oddly at me, as I claimed my valise in the lobby, and I hoped that none of these unpleasant creatures would be my fellow passengers on the coach. The bus, rather early, rattled in with three passengers somewhat before eight, and an evil-looking fellow on the sidewalk muttered a few indistinguishable words to the driver. Sergeant threw out a mailbag and a roll of newspapers and entered the hotel, while the passengers, the same men whom I had seen arriving in Newburyport that morning, shambled to the sidewalk and exchanged some faint, guttural words with a loafer in a language I could have sworn was not English. I boarded the empty coach and took the same seat I had taken before, but was hardly settled before Sergeant reappeared and began mumbling in a throaty voice of peculiar repulsiveness. I was, it appeared, in very bad luck. There had been something wrong with the engine despite the excellent time from Newburyport, and the bus could not complete the journey to Arkham. No, it could not possibly be repaired that night, nor was there any other way of getting transportation out of Innsmouth, either to Arkham or elsewhere. Sergeant was sorry, but I would have to stop over at the Gilman. Probably the clerk would make the price easy for me, but there was nothing else to do. Almost dazed by this sudden obstacle, and violently dreading the fall of night in this decaying and half-unlighted town, I left the bus and re-entered the hotel lobby, where the sullen, queer-looking night clerk told me I could have room 428 on next the top floor, large but without running water, for a dollar. Despite what I had heard of this hotel in Newburyport, I signed the register, paid my dollar, let the clerk take my valise, and followed that sour, solitary attendant up three creaking flights of stairs, past dusty corridors which seemed wholly devoid of life. My room, a dismal rear one with two windows and bare, cheap furnishings, overlooked a dingy courtyard otherwise hemmed in by low, deserted brick blocks and commanded a view of decrepit, westward-stretching roofs with a marshy countryside beyond. At the end of the corridor was a bathroom, a discouraging relic with ancient marble bowl, tin tub, faint electric light, and musty wooden paneling around all the plumbing fixtures. It being still daylight, I descended to the square and looked around for a diner of some sort, noticing as I did so the strange glances I received from the unwholesome loafers. 
Since the grocery was closed, I was forced to patronize the restaurant I had shunned before. A stooped, narrow-headed man with staring, unwinking eyes and a flat-nosed wench with unbelievably thick, clumsy hands being in attendance. The service was of the counter type, and it relieved me to find that much was evidently served from cans and packages. A bowl of vegetable soup with crackers was enough for me, and I soon headed back for my cheerless room at the Gilman. Getting an evening paper and a fly-specked magazine from the evil-visaged clerk at the rickety stand beside his desk. As twilight deepened, I turned on the one feeble electric bulb over the cheap, iron-framed bed and tried as best I could to continue the reading I had begun. I felt it advisable to keep my mind wholesomely occupied, for it would not do to brood over the abnormalities of this ancient, shadow-blighted town while I was still within its borders. The insane yarn I had heard from the aged drunkard did not promise very pleasant dreams, and I felt I must keep the image of his wild, watery eyes as far away as possible from my imagination. Also, I must not dwell on what the factory inspector had told the Newburyport ticket agent about the Gilman house and the voices of its nocturnal tenants. Not on that, nor on the face beneath the tiara in the black church doorway, the face for whose horror my conscious mind could not account. It would perhaps have been easier to keep my thoughts from disturbing topics had the room not been so gruesomely musty as it was. The lethal mustiness blended hideously with the town's general fishy odor and persistently focused one's fancy on death and decay. Another thing that disturbed me was the absence of a bolt on the door of my room. One had been there, as marks clearly showed, but there were signs of recent removal. No doubt it had become out of order, like so many other things in this decrepit edifice. In my nervousness I looked around and discovered a bolt on the clothes press, which seemed of the same size, judging from the marks, as the one formerly on the door. To gain a partial relief from the general tension, I busied myself by transferring this hardware to the vacant place with the aid of a handy three-in-one device, including a screwdriver which I kept on my key ring. The bolt fitted perfectly, and I was somewhat relieved when I knew that I could shoot it firmly upon retiring. Not that I had any real apprehension of its need, but that symbol of security was welcome in an environment of this kind. There were adequate bolts on the two lateral doors to connecting rooms, and these I proceeded to fasten. I did not undress, but decided to read till I was sleepy, and then lie down with only my coat, collar, and shoes off. Taking a pocket flashlight from my valise, I placed it in my trousers so that I could read my watch if I woke up later in the night. Drowsiness, however, did not come, and when I stopped to analyze my thoughts I found to my disquiet that I was really unconsciously listening for something, listening for something which I dreaded but could not name. That inspector's story must have worked on my imagination more deeply than I suspected. Again, I tried to read, but found that I made no progress. After a time, I seemed to hear the stairs and corridors creak at intervals, as if with footsteps, and wondered if the other rooms were beginning to fill up. There were no voices, however, and it struck me that there was something subtly furtive about the creaking. I did not like it, and debated whether I had better try to sleep at all. This town had some queer people, and there had undoubtedly been several disappearances. Was this one of those inns where travelers were slain for their money? Surely I had no look of excessive prosperity. Or were the townsfolk really so resentful about curious visitors? Had my obvious sightseeing with its frequent map consultations aroused unfavorable notice? It occurred to me that I must be in a highly nervous state to let a few random creakings set me off speculating in such fashion but I regretted nonetheless that I was unarmed. At length, feeling a fatigue which had nothing of drowsiness in it, I bolted the newly outfitted hall door, turned off the light, and threw myself down on the hard, uneven bed, coat, collars, shoes, and all. In the darkness, every faint noise of the night seemed magnified, 
and a flood of doubly unpleasant thoughts swept over me. I was sorry I had put out the light, yet was too tired to rise and turn it on again. Then, after a long, dreary interval, and prefaced by a fresh creaking of stairs and corridor, there came that soft, damnably unmistakable sound which seemed like a malign fulfillment of all my apprehensions. Without the least shadow of a doubt, the lock on my door was being tried, cautiously, furtively, tentatively, with a key. My sensations upon recognizing the sign of actual peril were perhaps less rather than more tumultuous because of my previous vague fears. I had been, albeit without definite reason, instinctively on my guard, and that was to my advantage in the new and real crisis, whatever it might turn out to be. Nevertheless, the change in the menace from vague premonition to immediate reality was a profound shock and fell upon me with the force of a genuine blow. It never once occurred to me that the fumbling might be a mere mistake. Malign purpose was all I could think of, and I kept deathly quiet, awaiting the would-be intruder's next move. After a time, the cautious rattling ceased, and I heard the room to the north entered with a passkey. Then, the lock of the connecting door to my room was softly tried, the bolt held, of course, and I heard the floor creak as the prowler left the room. After a moment came another soft rattling, and I knew that the room to the south of me was being entered. Again, a furtive trying of a bolted connecting door, and again a receding creaking. This time the creaking went along the hall and down the stairs, so I knew that the prowler had realized the bolted condition of my doors and was giving up his attempt for a greater or lesser time, as the future would show. The readiness with which I fell into a plan of action proves that I must have subconsciously been fearing some menace and considering possible avenues of escape for hours. From the first, I felt that the unseen fumbler meant a danger not to be met or dealt with, but only to be fled from as precipitately as possible. The one thing to do was to get out of the hotel alive as quickly as I could and through some channel other than the front stairs and lobby. Rising softly and throwing my flashlight on the switch, I sought to light the bulb over my bed in order to choose and pocket some belongings for a swift, valiseless flight. Nothing, however, happened, and I saw that the power had been cut off. Clearly, some cryptic, evil movement was afoot on a large scale. Just what, I could not say. As I stood pondering with my hand on the now useless switch, I heard a muffled creaking on the floor below and thought I could barely distinguish voices in conversation. A moment later, I felt less sure that the deeper sounds were voices, since the apparent hoarse barkings and loose-syllabled croakings bore so little resemblance to recognized human speech. Then, I thought with renewed force of what the factory inspector had heard in the night in this moldering and pestilential building. Having filled my pockets with the flashlight's aid, I put on my hat and tiptoed to the windows to consider chances of descent. Despite the state safety regulations, there was no fire escape on this side of the hotel, and I saw that my windows commanded only a sheer three-story drop to the cobbled courtyard. On the right and left, however, some ancient brick business blocks abutted on the hotel, their slant roofs coming up to a reasonable jumping distance from my fourth-story level. To reach either of these lines of buildings, I would have to be in a room two doors from my own, in one case on the north and in the other case on the south, and my mind instantly set to work calculating what chances I had of making the transfer. I could not, I decided, risk an emergence into the corridor where my footsteps would surely be heard and where the difficulties of entering the desired room would be insuperable. My progress, if it was to be made at all, would have to be through the less solidly built connecting doors of the rooms, the locks and bolts of which I would have to force violently, using my shoulder as a battering ram whenever they were set against me. This, I thought, would be possible owing to the rickety nature of the house and its fixtures, but I realized I could not do it noiselessly. I would have to count on sheer speed and the chance of getting to a window before any hostile forces became coordinated enough to open the right door toward me with a pass key. 
my own outer door I reinforced by pushing the bureau against it, little by little, in order to make a minimum of sound. I perceived that my chances were very slender, and was fully prepared for any calamity. Even getting to another roof would not solve the problem, for there would then remain the task of reaching the ground and escaping from the town. One thing in my favor was the deserted and ruinous state of the abutting buildings and the number of skylights gaping blackly open in each row. Gathering from the grocery boy's map that the best route out of town was southward, I glanced first at the connecting door on the south side of the room. It was designed to open in my direction, hence I saw, after drawing the bolt and finding other fastenings in place. It was not a favorable one for forcing. Accordingly abandoning it as a route, I cautiously moved the bedstead against it to hamper any attack which might be made on it later from the next room. The door on the north was hung to open away from me, and this, though a test proved it to be locked or bolted from the other side, I knew must be my route. If I could gain the roofs of the buildings in Payne Street and descend successfully to the ground level, I might perhaps dart through the courtyard and the adjacent or opposite buildings to Washington or Bates, or else emerge in Payne and edge around southward into Washington. In any case, I would aim to strike Washington somehow and get quickly out of the town square region. My preference would be to avoid Payne, since the fire station there might be open all night. As I thought of these things, I looked out over the squalid sea of decaying roofs below me, now brightened by the beams of a moon not much past full. On the right, the black gash of the river gorge clove the panorama, abandoned factories and railway station clinging barnacle-like to its sides. Beyond it, the rusted railway and the rally road led off from a flat, marshy terrain dotted with islets of higher and drier scrub-grown land. On the left, the creek-threaded countryside was nearer, the narrow road to Ipswich gleaming white in the moonlight. I could not see from my side of the hotel the southward route toward Arkham which I had determined to take. I was irresolutely speculating on when I had better attack the northward door and on how I could least audibly manage it, when I noticed that the vague noises underfoot had given place to a fresh and heavier creaking of the stairs. A wavering flicker of light showed through my transom, and the boards of the corridor began to groan with a ponderous load. Muffled sounds of possible vocal origin approached, and at length, a firm knock came at my outer door. For a moment, I simply held my breath and waited. Eternity seemed to elapse and the nauseous, fishy odor of my environment seemed to mount suddenly and spectacularly. Then, the knocking was repeated, continuously, and with a growing insistence. I knew that the time for action had come, and forthwith drew the bolt of the northward connecting door, bracing myself for the task of battering it open. The knocking waxed louder, and I hoped that its volume would cover the sound of my efforts. At last, beginning my attempt, I lunged again and again at the thin paneling with my shoulder, heedless of shock or pain. The door resisted even more than I had expected, but I did not give in. And all the while the clamor at the outer door increased. Finally the connecting door gave, but with such a crash that I knew those outside must have heard. Instantly the outside knocking became a violent battering while keys sounded ominously in the hall doors of the rooms on both sides of me. Rushing through the newly opened connection, I succeeded in bolting the northerly hall door before the lock could be turned, but even as I did so, I heard the hall door of the third room, the room whose window I had hoped to reach the roof below, being tried with a pass key. For an instant, I felt absolute despair, since my trapping in a chamber with no window egress seemed complete. A wave of almost abnormal horror swept over me and invested with a terrible but unexplainable singularity the flashlight glimpsed dust prints made by the intruder who had lately tried my door from this room. Then, with a dazed automatism which persisted despite hopelessness, I made for the next connecting door and performed the blind motion of pushing at it in an effort to get through and, granting that fastenings might be as providentially intact as in this second room, bolt the hall door beyond before the lock could be turned from outside. 
Sheer fortunate chance gave me my reprieve, for the connecting door before me was not only unlocked, but actually ajar. In a second, I was through, and had my right knee and shoulder against a hall door which was visibly opening inward. My pressure took the opener off guard, for the thing shut as I pushed so that I could slip the well-conditioned bolt as I had done with the other door. As I gained this respite, I heard the battering at the two other doors abate, while a confused clatter came from the connecting door I had shielded with the bedstead. Evidently, the bulk of my assailants had entered the southerly room and were massing in a lateral attack, but at the same moment, a pass key sounded in the next door to the north, and I knew that a nearer peril was at hand. The northward connecting door was wide open, but there was no time to think about checking the already turning lock in the hall. All I could do was shut and bolt the open connecting door, as well as its mate on the opposite side, pushing a bedstead against the one and a bureau against the other, and moving a washstand in front of the hall door. I must, I saw, trust to such makeshift barriers to shield me till I could get out of the window and on the roof of the Payne Street block, but even in this acute moment my chief horror was something apart from the immediate weakness of my defenses. I was shuddering because not one of my pursuers, despite some hideous pantings, gruntings, and subdued barkings at odd intervals, was uttering an unmuffled or intelligible vocal sound. As I moved the furniture and rushed toward the windows, I heard a frightful scurrying along the corridor toward the room north of me and perceived that the southward battering had ceased. Plainly, most of my opponents were about to concentrate against the feeble connecting door, which they knew must open directly on me. Outside, the moon played on the ridge pole of the block below, and I saw that the jump would be desperately hazardous because of the steep surface on which I must land. Surveying the conditions, I chose the more southerly of the two windows as my avenue of escape, planning to land on the inner slope of the roof and make for the nearest skylight. Once inside one of the decrepit brick structures, I would have to reckon with pursuit, but I hoped to descend and dodge in and out of yawning doorways along the shattered courtyard, eventually getting to Washington Street and slipping out of town toward the south. The clatter of the northerly connecting door was now terrific, and I saw that the weak paneling was beginning to splinter. Obviously, the besiegers had brought some ponderous object into play as a battering ram. The bedstead, however, still held firm, so that I had at least a faint chance of making good my escape. As I opened the window, I noticed it was flanked by heavy velour draperies suspended from a pole by brass rings, and also that there was a large projecting catch for the shutters on the exterior. Seeing a possible means of avoiding the dangerous jump, I yanked at the hangings and brought them down, pole and all. Then, quickly hooking two of the rings in the shutter catch and flinging a drapery outside, the heavy folds reached fully to the abutting roof, and I saw that the rings and catch would be likely to bear my weight. So, climbing out the window and down the improvised rope ladder, I left behind me forever the morbid and horror-infested fabric of the Gilman House. <laughs>